good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff LeBlanc, founder of Mare Nostrum and senior advisor within the government of Ecuador. I will be the moderator for today's session. The goal for today is to discuss policy surrounding the theme of protecting marine life in relation to 30 by 30. What are some of the key challenges when it comes to enforcement and how to prioritize which issues? Although negotiations for a new high seas treaty have encountered delays due to the pandemic, the 30 by 30 initiative has nevertheless picked up steam with more and more countries joining the Global Ocean Alliance, the High Ambition Coalition, and other groups that have the same objective in mind. Thanks to several groundbreaking reports, we now know that protecting 30% of the ocean by the year 2030 is what scientists consider necessary in order to safeguard biodiversity, to avoid the collapse of many fish stocks, and to also build resistance to climate change. To climate change. Nevertheless, right now we still face a situation where less than 4% of the ocean is protected and the clock is ticking. So today we're going to cover a number of important topics, including marine protected areas, illegal fishing, science-based standards, sustainable tourism, and so on. But before we get into specific questions, uh, we will first start things off by hearing a quick introduction from our three panelists. First up, we have Megan Brosnan, who is the Marine Program Director at Wild Aid. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Brosnan. I am a Wild Aid's Marine Program Director. Uh, my background, I was active duty Coast Guard for uh, 10 years. I'm still a reservist. Uh, during that time, I was a fisheries law enforcement expert. I was the boarding officer jumping on board ships and transitioned uh, into a position where I was the deputy chief for living marine resources enforcement. Uh, and I've been able to take that experience directly over to Wild Aid. Um, the marine program helps uh, countries build effective enforcement systems to protect their marine wildlife. Great. And next up, we have Dr. Sarah Hamid, Blue Parks Director and Senior Scientist at the Marine Conservation Institute. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, I'm Sarah Hamid. Uh, and as Jeff said, Blue Parks Director and Senior Scientist at Marine Conservation Institute. Uh, so I'm going to be um, talking today a lot about the Blue Parks Initiative, which is the aim of the Blue Parks Initiative is really a global ocean refuge system that effectively protects 30% of the ocean uh, in order to safeguard marine biodiversity. So it's a, it's a program that is perfectly aligned with those goals of protecting 30% of the global ocean by 2030. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And last up, we have Dewey Valiente, who is an SOA ocean youth leader and is also working for the government of Panama. Hello, good morning. My name is Diwig Di Valiente. I am in charge of sustainability issues at the Ministry of Tourism in Panama. I also have over a decade of experience working uh, in the Ministry of Panama in, in different ministries, not only the Ministry of Tourism, but also the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the Ministry of Education. My work is mostly focused on integrating indigenous communities in the development of efforts to uh, to help protect the ocean, especially in, in terms of tourism development. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Dewey, and all of the participants. Um, I guess we can start off now with some specific questions. Um, Megan, uh, I understand that you're currently working to make marine protected areas more effective. Perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit more about that. And in your opinion, what are some of the elements and measures needed to have a marine protected area that is truly effective? So I'll, I'll, I'll want to also uh, talk to hear Dr. Hamid's uh, views on that, um, as my, my perspective is primarily focused on the enforcement side of that. Um, I think the bottom line is that when MPAs are being designed and when they're moving forward, compliance and enforcement and of those laws within the MPAs must be considered from the beginning. Um, first part of that includes engagement with the coastal communities. Uh, it's a non-starter if you don't. Um, and the next, this next component of that is really designing the laws. There's ways to put the protected area together where it's easy for folks to follow the laws. And it's easy, also easy to identify if someone is violating the laws. Um, so it's a, 
it's a, uh, it's a process. It's not something that happens immediately, but if you're thoughtful about it, you can, you can build something that is going to be effective easily from the beginning. Great. Um, actually, well, if any of my questions, uh, if you'd like to, if anyone else in the panel would like to touch upon the same question, then go right ahead. So Dr. Hamid, if you'd like to do that, um, please go ahead. And I also wanted to ask you, uh, I've been very impressed with the Blue Parks Initiative and what it has accomplished in you know, the last years. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the Blue Parks Initiative and why it is important for us to create incentives for governments and other actors when it comes to ocean conservation. But please go ahead if you'd like to say a few words um, regarding the marine protected areas. Absolutely, thanks Jeff. Um, let me back up and talk a little bit about the global, I mean, the uh, Blue Parks Initiative, and then we can get into all of those aspects of marine protected areas that we know are related to what makes for a good one, an effective one that um, Megan started, um, ha has already addressed some of those, but uh, we can dig into that a little bit more in, um, as we get into Blue Parks. Um, but to backtrack just a little bit, uh, we know that we're threatening ocean ecosystems by dumping too much waste into the ocean and pulling too much life out of the ocean. Um, and we also know, though, that when we restrict activities like fishing and drilling and mining effectively, that ocean ecosystems rebound and they thrive again. So marine protected areas work when they're in the right places with the right rules and the right management and enforcement and compliance. So where are we right now? Globally, MPAs cover about 7% of the ocean. Um, and when you add the pending and proposed MPAs, you get to about uh, almost 8.5%. But it's actually less than 3% of the ocean that's in MPAs that restrict fishing and drilling and mining. So you're talking about a pretty uh, uh, you know, small area of the ocean that's covered in strong effective marine protected areas. Um, and of course, as you already mentioned, Jeff, scientists estimate that we need to protect at least 30% of the ocean in order to safeguard marine biodiversity. So how do we get from effectively protecting less than 3% to that 30%? Well, our big idea at Marine Conservation Institute is the Blue Parks Initiative, which is designed to accelerate the creation of effective MPAs by incentive. Um, so the Blue Park Awards are given, are given to marine protected areas that meet uh, science-based standards for conservation effectiveness. They bring international recognition, this third party seal of approval, which can lead to funding leverage. In addition to a sense of pride among the communities and MPA managers, NGO partners and governments that uh, are involved in the MPA. So with this incentive structure, Blue Parks aligns government interests with conservation. And it addresses that dual challenge of not enough MPAs and not effective enough MPAs. We think of the annual Blue Park Awards like the Oscars of the ocean. And it's an outstanding feeling to bring this kind of much needed recognition to the people who've poured their energy and passion into an effective MPA. So the result of the Blue Parks Initiative to date is a network of 17 awarded Blue Parks across many regions of the global ocean. And where we're beginning to put more effort is in MPAs that are getting close to the Blue Park standard but are not quite there. MPA planners and community leaders have reached out to us asking for guidance towards achieving effective MPAs and uh, achieving that Blue Park status, that uh, Blue Park award. So we're calling these collaborations our Blue Sparks. And these projects are gonna lead to more Blue Parks and help us build a stronger uh, uh, set of MPA standards and a network to, to uh, safeguard life in the sea. Great, great. No, that's incredibly interesting. And I'm currently based in Ecuador and I noticed that the Galapagos Marine Reserve is right now listed as a silver Blue Park award. Um, what do you think it would take us to, to get up to gold? Maybe you can explain a little bit about the different classifications. You have silver, gold, platinum, from what I saw, and then also yeah. the that That's new right. uh, category. That's right. And I, I tend to allude to our very uh, detailed 
uh, science-based criteria by talking about MPAs that are in the right places with the right rules and the right management. And of course, that is a, um, a way oversimplification, but it does point to some of these important attributes. So being in the right place has to do with, is this place important for marine biodiversity? Is it not just the political leftovers that, uh, that you know, nobody was, was trying to use? Is it truly an important place for supporting marine biodiversity with significant uh, um, marine ecosystems? Um, and certainly that is true of the Galapagos. Uh, so that's the, the right place. The right rules involves having really strict protections. There's just study after study has come out and a new one just came out, I think like a week or two ago about how you know weak regulations don't result in conservation benefits. So to go through the process and spend the time and energy and money on a marine protected area that doesn't restrict those most uh, uh, threatening activities. You know, it, uh, um, I, I look at, you know, marine protected areas, quote unquote, marine protected areas that, that don't even uh, ban bottom trawling. And we know how destructive bottom trawling is to ocean ecosystems. That's not a protected area, right? Um, and so that's part of, of the standard is having regulations that are truly protective. The gold standard here is you know, no extraction, no drilling, no mining, um, you know, having a really well protected area. Um, but we also know that some activities, if they're well managed and low impact, are um, compatible with protection and, and you can still see great conservation benefits. And so uh, we look very closely at how protective the regulations are in our Blue Park nominees. Um, but of course, the other end of that coin is um, how, how much compliance do you get with those regulations? If you have really strict regulations, but there's no compliance with them, uh, then that's not, not uh, going to result mm -hmm. in conservation benefits either. Um, and so yeah. as, as Megan's group is, is really great at getting into, and, and to get that compliance, you absolutely need the engagement and the voices and the buy-in of local communities. It's a non-starter, as she said, to try to get into, you know, or, or to see any kind of high compliance rate if you don't have buy-in from the local community and a sense of stewardship and, and uh, um, you know, engagement and management from local communities. Um, so these are all aspects of the, the uh, sort of detailed um, criteria for a Blue Park Award. Um, okay. Well, I think you touched on a, a lot of really good points, and I'd like to come back uh, to some of them a bit later on, especially, um, I'll keep using the Galapagos as a, as a case example, but there's mm -hmm. been a lot of talk about expanding the Galapagos Marine Reserve here, but... Um, is it worth expanding the reserve if there hasn't been enough resources to properly manage the current reserve and, and things of that nature? So maybe we'll come back to that um, a little bit later on, but that was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Um, so yeah, so next up uh, we have Dewey Valiente. Um, Dewey, I wanted to um, chat with you a little bit. I know that you've been doing a lot of great work with the government of Panama. You've been involved in everything from sustainable tourism in the context of supporting MPAs, uh, initiatives to eliminate single-use plastics, and a number of other projects focused on protecting marine life. How about we start um, by hearing about some of these projects? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, what Megan and Dr. Hamid were saying are, are very important points. The fact that we have to take into consideration the communities when we are creating the, these protected areas and the fact that we have to take into consideration the limits that we're going to put the communities that are living around that area. Those limits most probably will impact the, the image of development that these communities have. So what we have to do from the government standpoint, I believe is to support the communities in finding the right activities that will protect the marine areas, but will also provide them with uh, income or activities that are low impact, protect and, 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 and help the research of the marine areas, but also 
uh, provide certain economic uh, freedom for the communities. Taking this into account from the government of Panama standpoint, we have been working very closely with the communities in order to create a new touristic route based on the blue heritage of Panama. So we have divided Panama in four sections. We have the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And in the Pacific, we have two big ecosystems that are different based on the marine currents that are in that area and, and the species that have flourished in those area, areas. Also in, in, in the Pacific, we have two other areas and based on these four locations, we are creating specific touristic routes that will give the communities to understand better what they have, because sometimes not even the communities understand the value of their uh, protected areas or marine par parks that are, that are around them. So <clears throat> we give the opportunities to the communities to understand the value of the sea and, and, and the ocean that surrounds them but we also give them the opportunity to understand how protecting those ecosystems can be of uh, economic, environmental, and social benefits for everyone. In Panama, we have been working very hard to make awareness on plastic pollution. Um, three years ago, we passed a law to ban single-use plastic and, and plastic bags. Nowadays, uh, this law has been uh, in force, but as you know, it's not only a matter of having the law, but also the tools to make sure that everyone is following the laws. And those that cannot follow the laws have an opportunity to, to, to comply with the law and, and, and to get to a certain de uh, degree of development when they can actually integrate what the regulations are. So if we, if we create laws or regulations that do not take into consideration the local communities, or if we create and develop projects uh, for the conservation of certain marine areas that do not take into consideration the communities, most probably those efforts are going to be pointless in the end, because we end up with communities that are not happy with the fact that they are not, be, are not going to be able to probably fish in, cer in certain areas that for them historically have been um, free to access. And when these conflicts arrive, it's very important to take, to, to take a, a moment to understand why the communities are not happy or why the communities are, um, op are opposing to the regulations that the government uh, tries to, to, to start. Great, fantastic. And I really like this conversation. Maybe we can kind of transition it back to Megan a little bit. Um, what you talked about, uh, what you said about community involvement, I, I truly believe it is one of the most important elements to all of this. Uh, when the pandemic hit here in Ecuador, uh, we saw tourism drop in areas like the Galapagos almost completely. And what happened next is that, you know, all of the communities that depended on tourism, they started looking at other ways of making a living. And a lot of them put forth an effort to bring back long lining in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And it was a very big challenge for the Galapagos Park because on one hand, you need to do whatever you can to protect a lot of the critically endangered species such as the scallop hammerhead, the whale sharks. Um, but you are in a situation where Galapagos depended almost 100% on tourism. And now there's a, a big push to, for people to make a living. So. Getting back to, to you, Megan, um, I guess my question is, what do you recommend for countries that are maybe looking to create stronger protection measures, especially in the context of enforcement or additional no take, zone, take zones, um, but lack the resources to do so or are facing pressures such as the pressures that I you know, just mentioned um, in the case of the Galapagos? Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about lacking resources. Uh, this is a question I always get, and it's an important one, right? If we are designing a compliance and enforcement system, what, what I call, what Wild Aid Marine calls a marine protection system, that could never be financially sustained independently 
by the local government, then you failed, bottom line. Uh, what I would say to that is that there seems to be a few errors in thinking that get that lead to that conclusion. The first is we do not need perfect compliance to meet our conservation, our livelihood and our community outcomes that we need, okay? I have been known to jaywalk and to speed occasionally, right? Like no one follows the laws all the time and that is okay. You just need to have the level high enough where species, people, communities thrive. So um, the first is to shift your mindset towards it's okay if it's not a perfect system. It's not ever going to be a perfect system. Um, the next is getting super pragmatic about it. Nearshore, coastal marine protected areas and coastal zones do not need huge Navy oceanic vessels or radars when if you're high enough up in a lookout tower with a pair of binoculars and have two outboard engines hanging out the back of your boat, you're covered, right? Yeah. So I like to say, design a system where uh, if a Honda Civic is gonna do the job, don't put a Porsche in, in place. Uh, so that's just a, those, uh, you know, similarly, Sometimes you need radars, radar or satellite systems. Sometimes you need vessel transponders. Sometimes you don't. So it's it's a lot of just designing the system that makes sense for that. I could talk about this for hours, so I'm going to stop on that and happy to revisit it. Um, in terms of the communities and how do you handle this fundamental need to maintain your livelihoods? What I'm, one thing I'm really hoping that we're gonna learn from this initiative is that, uh, and Dewey, I'm about to step into your world, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but uh, when you're building a system based off of tourism, you have to expect that there's gonna be an ebb and flow, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that thoughtful design in collaboration with the coastal communities, whose cultural heritage that area is in anticipation of there's gonna be thriving times and less thriving times will help buffer against this, right? There are ways to catch fish, as Dr. Hamid said, that don't involve totally destroying a habitat, that don't evolve, involve huge amounts of bycatch of a highly endangered species. Sorry, I'm getting technical to catch. Um, so, that's the, uh, you know, so that would be my, my fundamental there is just yeah. thinking about it that way. Uh, and also just accepting that there's going to be give and take sometimes it's never going to be perfect. <laughs> so. No, no, that's, that's absolutely right. I think, you know, using the, the case of the Galapagos, we really need to focus on diversifying the economy there in case we do get hit by a pandemic or some unexpected uh, events, you know, connectivity is something that is incredibly important for those islands and in many in many islands around the world, um, because it's difficult for people to maybe find work abroad or to have any sort of distant learning if you don't have a good connectivity um, system in place. So, no, those are all really good uh, tips and advice. And um, yeah, getting back to to Dr. Hamid, maybe. You, my question, I guess, would be, I sometimes see proposals for MPAs or other area-based management plans falling short, often due to a lack of scientific evidence. You know, what can the Marine Conservation Institute do to help governments that are struggling with this important um, step? The step being establishing the scientific basis for a new marine protected area? Yeah, exactly. So if there is initiatives to increase marine protected areas um, or an existing marine protected area to create a new marine protected area, um, you know, and maybe the government or the different actors lack specific knowledge or resources, is the Marine Conservation Institute able to provide any advice on, on those matters or to, to step in to help? Yeah, so um, there are sort of uh, certainly a set of principles and, um, you know, biological, um, you know, sort of monitoring 
protocols that we can share. But really, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, what we have to offer is a global network of marine scientists with expertise in all the different marine ecosystems of the global ocean um, and with expertise in the different uh, uh, regions of the global ocean. And so um, that network in part sort of signified by our uh, science council, which is made up of about 30 of these uh, marine science experts from around the world um, is, I think, really one of our most powerful assets. I mean, really, you know, at the end of the day, Marine Conservation Institute is a fairly small organization uh, with a very big initiative in the Blue Parks Initiative. And uh, the way we make it work is by uh, extraordinary partnerships and a, a sort of ecosystem of partners around the globe. Uh, and that particularly includes our science network. Um, as a science-based organization, our go-to network is the, the network of marine scientists around the globe, uh, interdisciplinary scientists. So um, <clears throat> really it's, it's those scientists and their colleagues um, and their work that, that uh, is most often used as the foundation for establishing the case for uh, marine protected areas. Marine Conservation Institute is engaged in that kind of work, uh, but uh, predominantly in the US um, and the Pacific. Uh, so we, we don't have on the ground offices and scientists around the world. Oh, okay, okay, great, great. Well, no, I, I mean, I'm incredibly interested uh... In, in everything that you guys are doing. And I think that it's a fantastic incentive to encourage more MPAs. So I think we'll definitely come back to that uh, a couple more times in this session, but maybe to change the rhythm a little bit, um, I've got a question for Dewey, uh, specifically related to the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and some of the things that you guys are doing. Um, I know that in recent years, there's been a growing international interest to mine the deep seabed in order to access precious metals and minerals such as copper, cobalt, et cetera. Uh, this of course has caused a great deal of concern given that the deep seabed is a unique ecosystem with many unique species. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what the Sustainable Ocean Alliance is doing to address this issue and whether you think measures prohibiting this activity should be included in a new high seas treaty or uh, something along those lines. Sure, when, when we're talking about the seabed and the initiatives in regards of mining the seabed, we have to take into account that there is there is too much that we still don't know. And uh, if we want to base our economic system in a system that is really driving and, and focus on sustainability, we have to start thinking about cir circular economy and other ways of finding the minerals and all the, all the um, um, all the things that we are expecting to find out in the deep of the ocean. And from the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, what we have been proposing is a moratorium uh, so that we have some more time to actually understand what's in the deep sea and, and how these, these species that we probably don't know yet can actually be beneficial for the development of knowledge um, to to fight against climate change, or probably to find new ways to create energy. All these are, are resources that are pro probably there in the bottom of the ocean, but we still don't understand to the fullest, and we still don't know yet how to take advantage of them. So if we want to start just mining the ocean as we have been doing with, with the land over the last decades, probably the, the results in the, in the short term are going to be beneficial for some companies and, and some, uh, some people, but in the medium and long term, the negative impacts that we will have in the overall health of the planet is probably very negative. So we have to, we have to think more collectively. Um, in terms of sustainability, we have to think more also about circular, circular economy and how we can make everything work with, with what we already have taken from, from the land and from the ocean. And based on that, we, we can actually start thinking of, of a positive future for humankind. Great, fantastic. 
Um, Dr. Hamid or Megan, would you like to touch on that at all before? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what he said. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Great, great. <laughs> no, I, know I, I just wanted to add something uh, following <laughs> what Dr. Hamid were, were, was talking about scientific knowledge and what we have mm -hmm. been doing in Panama over the last year was to work very closely with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute to make sure mm -hmm. that the knowledge that we have and, and on what we are basing the development of this new heritage tourism routes are actually coming from scientists that understand what are the ecosystems and what are the needs to conserve and to help protect these ecosystems. But we are not only protecting the ecosystems, we are also focusing on researching these ecosystems. And based on the content that we can get from the scientific research, we can create a, tourism, a touristic product or a tourist service that is more highly elevated and can, can actually attract uh, a conscious traveler that's also willing to spend more money on the locations. And this conscious traveler is not only worried about spending the money on the communities, but they want their money to actually have a positive, positive impact socially and environmentally. So this is the kind of market that we have to start creating a trawler market that is actually focused on regener regenerating the ecosystems, not only conserving and, and protecting the ecosystem, but we have to start talking now about regenerating those ecosystems. That's exactly right. What Dewey is talking about, it points exactly to, you know, this really interdisciplinary process of, of getting to effective marine protection, which involves, you know, that science side and these, these partnerships between government and scientists are so important. Um, in addition to these partnerships with local communities and then thinking about the economy and, and marrying that all together in management plans that involves, you know, still scientific monitoring of the ecosystem so you can see if the decisions you're making and the management you're implementing and the enforcement strategies and compliance strategies you have in place are effectively uh, conserving the ecosystem and rebuilding the ecosystem. And so all of that comes together in a really effective management plan that's revisited, you know, annually and, and every few years to, to sort of see how it's going and make changes uh, where they're needed. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that last point that you made is, is incredibly important to make sure that it's continuously revisited, you know, on a, on a regular basis. Um, Megan, uh, I have a question for you. For someone who spent uh, four years at sea enforcing fisheries law, I wanted to ask you a question about transshipments. We know that transshipment at sea is often associated with patterns of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. It provides the opportunity to mix, uh, mix illegal catch with legitimate catch and can obscure the, the seafood supply chain. Um, although many RFMOs restrict transshipments to ports or require vessels to have onboard observers, many RFMOs lack the ability or sometimes the willingness to enforce their own rules. Uh, given your experience, do you have any recommendations for how transshipments um, at sea should be dealt with in the future, either at government level or um, RFMO level? Yeah, so our recommendations as a wild aid when you're managing within an exclusive economic zone, uh, so within a nation's wa own waters, is to not allow transshipments. Um, yeah, I have been on board a fishing vessel trying to estimate how much catch is and recognizing that I'm looking at the top layer of maybe, you know, 30 feet of fish underneath there, and there's no way. For me to estimate that there's no way for me to look for uh, hidden compartments because I can't physically access huge proportions mm -hmm. of the ship. Uh, not to mention, like it was like harrowing to even get on board the boat. You're trying not to get sick on top of the fish because it's you know swinging back and forth, and like it's just not it's not a viable option. So when a country yeah. has that option to take that uncertainty out of the equation, 
it, it just makes it, it makes a huge difference from a compliance perspective. The high C's, RFMOs, it's a whole other equation, as you know, because, uh, you know, vast majority of them, everyone has to agree. Um, very few have boarding and inspection procedures that even allow inspection at C. No. Bottom line, the simpler you can make it to verify compliance. And that's not just for the enforcement officers. I mean, trust me, every single enforcement officer that doesn't have to go down into a fish hold will thank you. But uh, it's for everyone to know that everyone is following the rules and that everybody is taking this, the steps to make sure that the future generations have these resources, have the thriving oceans, is gonna yeah. be simpler. So things like just not having transshipment or if that's not viable, simplifying it down to a, a highly transparent process is gonna, is gonna make it a, a better future for us, so. No, fantastic. I, I completely agree. And I bring it up because it is a really big issue in the South Pacific um, right now. If you look at the Galapagos, um, you know, especially outside the exclusive economic zone, there's been a lot of activity from distant water fishing fleets. And I believe during the last visit, there was over 73,000 hours of fishing logged in just one month. So, you know, that would not be possible if it were not for for transshipments and other reasons too, government subsidies, et cetera. But um, we see it as a very important strategy uh, for our government anyway, to propose to the South Pacific RFMO to end all transshipments um, within, that, um, within that management organization. So we're proposing them right now and I'll, I'll keep you updated on what happens. I hope it goes forward. Um, and also, what did I wanna say? Yeah, um, basically, if it, if, it, if it does go forward, um, then it will be binding on all 15 members of the South Pacific RFMO. And what's good about the South Pacific RFMO is that we only need a 75% um, approval rating, unlike some of the other regional fishing management organizations that need 100% consensus. So we're trying to get as much support as we can to end transshipments and to also uh, hopefully include onboard observers, uh, virtual observers, or in-person observers on a lot of these vessels as well. So, no, I completely agree with your assessment on, on that one. It's better to, <laughs> to eliminate them altogether. Um, well, great. Uh, getting back to you, Dr. Hamid, I know that MPAs have been very successful in replenishing fish stocks and often creating a spillover effect, but I'm curious, to what degree can no-take zones or highly protected MPAs provide resilience uh, or a buffer against ecosystem disruption caused by climate change and ocean acid acidification? I don't think we've touched on that yet, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that topic. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> you're right. So once we you know, protect uh, uh, ecosystems from destructive fishing and mining and <clears throat> all these sorts of uh, really um, dangerous activities for ocean ecosystems, uh, they rebound and, and they thrive is what we find. And that often, you know, ends up, uh, and there's a lag time here, unfortunately, um, it would be a lot easier politically if it was all immediate, but there's um, yeah. a, a benefit to fisheries outside of those protected areas. And that's what you call the spillover effect. Uh, so that's exactly right. MPAs also, you know, these, these, thriving ecosystems are much more resilient to perturbations, we'll call them, and that includes ocean acidification. Um, however, I don't want to overstate that fact. At the end of the day, you know, in, in terms of ocean acidification, in terms of warming temperatures of the ocean, marine protected areas alone can't um, complete, you know, can't mitigate these big, you know, ocean scale, global scale problems that we're facing. And so marine protected areas are a really crucial part of our solution to preserving marine biodiversity and ourselves. Mm -hmm. But we also need to be acting on climate change simultaneously. We can't, we, we, we can't sort of uh, ignore the other uh, major piece of the puzzle here. 
with respect to climate change. So no, marine protected areas, really important piece of the puzzle. They're not a panacea and great marine protected areas alone aren't gonna do it. Um, neither for that matter is acting on climate change gonna do it. We've gotta do both if we want mm -hmm. to safeguard marine biodiversity. And as I said, ourselves um, in the crosshairs. Great, great. No, thank you so much for, for that response. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, maybe I've got some questions that maybe I could throw out to the entire group and we'll see who would like to, to answer them. Um, my first question is actually, if a new high seas treaty is created and many countries agree to protecting 30% of the ocean through the creation of MPAs, enforcement will undoubtedly remain one of the biggest challenges. My question for the group is what technologies, whether satellites or long distance drones, virtual observers, do you think will be needed to make monitoring and enforcement on such a large scale um, possible? And yeah, like I said, if anyone would like to take a stab at, at this question, please go ahead and uh, we can go back and forth. Sure, I, I think um, technology is such an important part of this equation and, and we have to understand how to use technology for, for the better. In Panama, we have been trying to have a system um, in where you can buy the, the tickets, tickets to access the marine protected areas. And mm -hmm. within that system, we also are planning to have a location um, system in order to identify, in, identify which boats and with whom are inside the protected areas using geolocation and, and, and satellites. But if we look at the bigger picture, I think we have to start thinking on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and how based on uh, artificial intelligence, we can actually make the laws and the regulations harder in terms of uh, compliance. If we are able to create a system that that can automatically tell us if someone is breaking a certain or like breaking in a certain area <clears throat> and, and the report automatically send a message to the police or the coast guards, uh, then we can have a better um, coverage of, of the protection, but also we can, we can have less people and less resources in the surveillance and, and more in the research and, and, uh, and we can like put more efforts into conservation itself. I'll just say Great. that, yeah. yeah, that I'm guessing that um, this will have something to do with making the rules easy that uh, Megan mentioned earlier, but I'm really keen to hear what Megan has to say about this because she's my go-to on these kinds of questions. <laughs> yeah. I I would say yes, absolutely, Dr. Hamid. And like a simple example of that would be as you are building a system that mandates vessels, you know, being able to be trapped within a tourism zone, uh, that system must be turned on at all times. Maybe you have even you have two systems, like a vessel monitoring system and an AIS. And if mm -hmm. it fails, I'm sorry you have to go back to port, yeah. right? There's systems like that where you can just speak, and this has to be done in such close collaboration to make sure that you're not in the process sinking the industry, the, you know, the tourism industry that you're trying to build or anything else. But uh, yeah, there you need to be, definitely need to be thinking about that underpinning underneath there. Um, I think the other thing is that there's a lot of, there's layers of technology that is going to make this easier. So at the upper end, right, AI, satellite-based monitoring, sorry, AI is artificial intelligence, right? Um, there, are, These are ways to make, when you've got a lot of data and really large areas, very mm -hmm. simple for enforcement officials, just like DOE explained. But at the lower, at the really like basic level, we can't forget that like who hasn't screamed when, I don't know, your Excel database crashed and you lost half your data, 
Now mm -hmm. imagine that that data had all of the case tracking for your prosecutions. Mm -hmm. May or may not have had partners where that's happened. May or may not have had some types of things happen when I was in the Coast Guard, right? Like the mm -hmm. basics have to work well and they are essential because if there's no consequences for catching a, vi a violator, then like you are, you're not gonna see increased compliance. Uh, if the coastal community uh, is really integrated and they're like, yeah, protected area, we wanna make this happen and they see something happening, do they have an easy way that's trackable maybe that's that they can report that information and actually be told that something happens and have that report be acknowledged usually doesn't happen right um yeah. is there a way for if you have a navy and a park service mm -hmm. for the navy and the park service to share information so that you're not both boarding the same vessel and each giving them a warning next time next time and not, neither of you recognizes that this guy has been you know breaking the law for three months straight, but you, because you didn't communicate with each other, right? So there's also this like just doing the basics well and making those systems really easy to use, which it's not sexy, but it's not there yet <laughs> in a lot of places. Uh, that's gonna make a big difference in the long run. Great, yeah. Well, I, I brought up the distant water fishing fleets there earlier and we did run to a number of situations where there was evidence presented of them turning off their signals around the exclusive economic zone. So it definitely brought a lot of concerns um, here. And I, I do believe that very soon we'll be receiving cooperation from the government of Canada. I think they have a technology called, I'm not sure, Dark Vessel Watch or something along those lines that's going to help us detect those vessels that end up going dark on, on screen. But no, all great points. Very very interesting. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone else wanted to say anything about that before I move on. I think that also besides technology, the, the human factor, as, as Megan was mentioning, is super important because if the communities understand the value of preserving the ecosystem and, and if they can understand that based on these ecosystems, their future depends not only in matters of like resources that they can take out of uh, out from the ecosystem, but uh, the fact that this ecosystem can be a touristic product in the future. And if they don't protect it, uh, if we have less fish or if we end up not having coral reefs, then the tourists are not going to come. And, and for Panama, which is a, a country that is it's pretty much based on a service economy, Tourism is one of the main important industries. Uh, so in the moment when the, the communities understand that they can lose their main source of income, then they will be part of the surveillance team and they will make sure that everyone, not only the community, but also the private enterprises, the fishermen, um, the hotels, the restaurants, everyone is actually in the same um, line of protecting uh, the resources. Great, great points, uh, Dewey. Um, well, moving on to the, the next question, I wanted to ask a bit of a, a fun question for you all. I don't know if you've seen, but recently uh, The Economist asked David Attenborough and a group of other experts, if they had $1 billion to save the ocean, what would they spend it on? Uh, I found it to be a very interesting exercise, and I'm curious to hear some of your your answers. If you'd like to give it a shot, <laughs> not it. It's a tough one, but <laughs> kind of puts you on the spot. But <laughs> so I'll go for it if I can. Maybe come back later since I'm going first. <laughs> I. Uh, yeah, they said this is this will be edited, so uh, okay. I guess you. Can, <laughs> you can <edit> <laughs> um, so, to me, my passion in all this is in not just the establishment of the marine protected areas, but it's in the implementation. It's in doing it in a way that's effective, and we know, right? There is a whole suite of fisheries management, MPA management tools 
that can be done in data poor situations, right? We know how to do sustainable tourism. We know how to properly engage with folks. We know what the legal process needs to be. It just seems like there's a lot of effort and research that goes towards the establishment of the marine protected areas. We need equal, if not more effort going towards the support of establishing the implementation of the marine mm -hmm. protected areas in the long run. Because if you like, they're not, a, like like Dr. Hamid said, if they're not a protected area, if they're not actually protected. Yeah. Um, so with a billion dollars, I think it's really bringing together what already exists and making it easily accessible to governments, to communities mm -hmm. as they're going forward. And there are, as you, you know, alluded to, there are different coalitions that are working on towards that. Man, man, I think it would be amazing if we, if we just brought more into that and made, and really superpowered that. I mean, best available science, which is not very good on this topic, is at least 60% of all marine protected areas don't have effective management and enforcement systems in place, at least. Yeah. So like, well, you're <laughs> Megan makes well, a really, yeah oh sorry no I just wanted to say one quick thing I, your answer was actually quite close to David Attenborough so oh, was it? Good answer. oh yes, I like to hear that <laughs> he's a smart guy yeah <laughs> he uh, is please, a smart Dr. guy and I'm and good. Megan's smart too I I would build on that I think I think that is um you know a um kind of a uh a pitfall of funding for marine protected areas traditionally, which has been, you know, throw some money at, at getting a marine protected area designated. That is, mm -hmm. you know, just the tip of the iceberg for getting to effective marine conservation. Um, you know, what we know from the science is that it's, it's really 10 years down the road that you really see the full suite of conservation benefits. And that's from a marine protected area that is, you know, not only legally designated, but, or, or uh, maybe not even legally designated, but fully established uh, and, you know, with good enforcement and compliance rates and good management. Um, so it's, you know, it's way down the line that you really get the, the benefits. And so that, that sticking with it and establishing a sustainable economy around them, things that Dee we talked about earlier, um, and, and establishing, you know, a community and government commitment to them, uh, to prioritize them is, I think, really key. Um, so yeah, I like Megan's answer. I don't have a, a particularly better answer other than you know supporting the 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 initiatives that are going to help sort of drive those kinds of sustainable long-term well-protected mpas and so initiatives like blue parks um also you know initiatives to get uh uh high seas protections um and to get to 30 percent not just 30 percent of the ocean but 30% of the ocean in effective protections. Um, I think mm -hmm. all of those are, are, you know, the priority. No, those are all great points from, from both you and, and Megan. And um, yeah, last but not least, Dewey, if you'd like to take a shot at it as well. Sure, I think from an indigenous perspective, but also from the perspective of someone that grew up in a Latin country, in a developing country um we haven't been able like people from these latitudes haven't been able to actually understand how our environment make us rich because for certain indexes panama is a poor country you know or like certain regions regions of panama are extremely poor because they live with less than a dollar a day but in those same areas, you can still see at least six different types of mangroves, uh, tons of fish, hammerhead sharks, tiger sharks, bull sharks, and all these different species that you cannot find in other places anymore. And those make us rich. But 
we haven't been able to understand the richness of those ecosystems. So if I, if I had that amount of money, I would probably create a program to, to make awareness, uh, not only of the protection and, and um, how it's important to, to, to create new marine protected areas, but also to develop understanding on, on how this is actually something that can create economic benefits for society not only in terms of tourism, but also in terms of scientific knowledge, in terms of new technology that we can actually create understanding what is already in the ocean. So I would use $1, one million actually to, 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 to make indigenous people, black people, people that have been marginalized over the last decades, under, to make them understand how rich they are in resources, and how to package those resources in order to make it make them commercially available for a conscious traveler. And, and you know, now with this pandemic, people are in their houses and they cannot go out and, 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 and who wouldn't want to go and visit an indigenous communities? But the indigenous community right now think that they don't deserve being visited and that what they have is not enough for, for people to, to consider them as, as valuable people as well. No, it's a fantastic answer, Dewey. And um, yeah, actually one of, the, one of the people in that program, when they were asked the question, they, they touched upon that and they did focus a lot on, on education as well and how you know, he would put $1 billion directly into education just to teach a lot of people in, in their communities or in their early years in school that, you know, most of our oxygen is coming from the ocean, just simple things to get people connected more to the ocean so that they can start to grow up taking more, um, more care of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to add something there because yeah. um, from my personal experience, seven years mm -hmm. ago, I didn't know anything about climate change, even though my indigenous people is the first documented case of an indigenous group that is forced to be moved because of the rising of the sea level. And I didn't know anything about it. So even though I have had an uh, education in the city and I have studied abroad also, mm -hmm. my main topics have always been uh, regarding the inclusion of indigenous people, but not yeah. the, the environmental aspects of it. And then when I, I understood that climate change was affecting us so bad, I started understanding as well what the, 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 the impact of plastic was and why it was so important to make awareness of climate change. But most of the people don't even know this and most of the people don't even know all the benefits that the ocean gave us, what you just said, that most of the oxygen, oxygen that we breathe of comes from the ocean. We are a country that is surrounded by ocean, and, and I'm pretty sure that less than 90% of the population of Panama knows these kind of facts. So yeah, education is extremely important, especially in, in these uh, countries that are still understanding what sustainability is about. Great, no, thank you so much, uh, Dewey. That's um, excellent uh, input on, on that one. Um, I know that we're we're coming to an end, so I wanted to kind of wrap things up with just one final item, and we thought it would be a good idea for each panelist to maybe put forth a, a call to action to either recommend a, a petition, a website, or to discuss something that uh, you can personally do to help make a difference. Um, so again, if you'd like to take a moment uh, to, to think of uh, some sort of call for action, that would be great. I'll, um, okay, yeah. yeah. Maybe Sarah, um, would you like to start us off? Great. Absolutely. Um, so my call to action is first and foremost to start local. What is your local MPA? What, in, what marine protected area are you a constituent of? And, and reach out and engage with that marine protected area. One of the things that I've learned about marine protected areas is the ones that are really successful 
have whole ecosystems of communities surrounding them, supporting them and engaging with them. Uh, none of them do it all with their own sort of staff and manager and, and budget. Um, they do it with partnerships with local NGOs and with concerned individuals. Uh, and so build that sense of stewardship, go out and, and find your local MPAs um, and, and, and start to think about where they are um, excelling in protecting marine biodiversity and, and what they still need. What gaps can you help fill? Uh, and if you have a marine protected area that is deserving of a Blue Park Award, nominate it. We're accepting nominations for the 2021 Blue Park Awards right now. So you can go to blueparks.org. That'll take you to the, the uh, initiatives site. And from there, you can navigate to uh, uh, a, a way that you can um, nominate your local MPA for a Blue Park Award. And if it's not right, how can you help fill in the gaps? Um, that's where it starts. We've, we've got to you know, start with all of our existing MPAs, as we've already pointed out. We've got a ton out there, um, not yet enough, but many that are not yet meeting the standards to actually uh, uh, you know, produce any conservation benefits. So we got to start with those and, and raise the level, raise the bar for them. Um, so that is my call to action, is to get engaged in marine protected areas. And then you know, to support them, figure out what they need. Great. No, thank you so much. Um, Megan, would you like to go next or? I can go first. Okay, perfect. Since I'm in the spotlight. <laughs> yeah, I just noticed. That. <laughs> um, I am very passionate about sharks and I love sharks and, and I love swimming with them. I, 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 I'm, I'm really passionate about them. And and it's a pity to know that most of the people don't understand sharks or, or are afraid of sharks and are willing to kill them uh, for food, even though it's not really necessary. And sometimes it can produce negative effects in, in our system if we consume uh, shark or certain marine species. Um, so yeah, my call to action would be to check what you're eating, uh, especially when you're ordering uh, fish sometimes it's not fish and sometimes it's shark. Make sure that the seafood that you eat comes from a sustainable source. Um, in countries such as United States, I think this is something uh, more difficult to actually identify if the, the seafood that you're, you're having comes from a sustainable source. But try to investigate and, and try to find out what's actually on, on, your, on your plate. Because even though you might think it's sea bass, it might probably be baby sharks. Um, so yeah, be careful with what you eat. Great, that's fantastic. Um, Megan, you're up. So everything that Dr. Hamid and Dewey said. Yep. Um, also, just gonna put on my law dog hat here. Like most of the folks that are listening to this probably interact with the ocean in some way. Maybe you have a, co a local beach, maybe you go on vacation to the beach. Like it, maybe you love deep sea fishing and you take out a charter fishing. Mm -hmm. It's your job to know what the laws are. Don't know, you should be asking. Like yeah. I, I may or may not before I knew better have gone fishing in places where I now know I absolutely needed a license and I didn't have one. Shame on me. Right? So everybody's job to be following the laws where you are. If you are planning on taking a vacation somewhere that's ocean-based, think about reserving now, okay? Mm -hmm. Businesses need money now. If you, if you can afford it to put down a down payment now, it's gonna help a lot. So mm -hmm. I would encourage folks to look at that. Plus, darn it, it's fun to like nerd out and like have a place that you were like have in mind that's a beautiful place you can go to. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put in the, the mandatory uh, marine.wildaid.org. We'll have, you'll have all the, re the resources, but if you wanna learn more about uh, other ways to build marine protection systems, or if you have a marine protected area in mind that could benefit from our support, Mm -hmm. Come, we're, we're looking for we're looking for partners. We don't do anything alone. So, okay, 
Great, Megan. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, since we're wrapping up, I may just um, get in a quick few words on that topic as well to expand on what Dewey said. Um, the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act is uh, legislation that's currently in the United States. And if it is passed, it will ban the trade of shark fins throughout the entire US. Uh, the Congress has already passed the bill and we're just waiting on the Senate to vote on it. So to kind of support what, what Dewey is saying in terms of you know taking a, keeping track of exactly what you're eating to make sure that it's not Corvina as here in, here in Ecuador, a lot of people are eating Corvina thinking uh, or sorry, a lot of people are eating shark thinking that it is Corvina. Um, uh, I think we also need to keep an eye on just trade measures as well. So the Shark Fin Sales Elimination Act, I'd like to current, encourage anyone to you know, talk to their senators, sign our petition. I believe Oceana has a petition as well. At my foundation, we have a petition. So hopefully we get the votes it needs to pass very soon. But yeah, fantastic. That was great. Um, thank you so much for participating in, in the panel. Um, it was really insightful all around. I've learned a lot today and thank you so much. Thank you.